Now we had a little bit of discussion earlier about biofields, uh, but not using that term, uh, there was some discussion about healing energy, healing touch and so forth. But uh, the word biofield, this is a relatively new term for really an old idea. And the uh, simple definition I came up with is simply, the biofield refers to the energy field associated with living beings. And if you were to go online and Google the word biofield, you're going to come up with some images like this. This is fairly esoteric stuff when we're talking about traditional allopathic medicine, and I'll get into that in a minute. But the concept of a biofield is that it's an energy field associated with a living being that not only uh, surrounds the body, but actually permeates the entire body, the cells, everything. And that the health of the physical body is really dependent on properly functioning energy body and the interaction between the energy body and the physical body as we know it. Now, when I was growing up, uh, this wasn't that far of a concept. I grew up with lots of images of saints. And you can see this image of a saint here has uh, this white light around the head. When I was growing up, we were told that these are called halos. Uh, later, when I got older, I learned the term aura. But you can see this particular saint, there's the, the depict, this is an old image of Saint Sebastian. You can see the halo, but there's also depicted energy around the, the rest of the body as well. Not that unlike these. And this is something common in, of course, across all traditions and philosophies from religions and philosophies. Here's an image of the Buddha. So when I'm using the term biofield, that's what I'm referring to. What does the US government have to say about the term biofields? <laughs> turns out, turns out the government does have something to say about biofields. The official position of NIH, you know, National Institutes of Health, and specifically the NCAM Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine. Biofields are putative energy fields that surround and penetrate the human body. The existence of such fields have defied measurement, however, to date, by reproducible methods. I would agree with this last sentence. I, I work in a very traditional biochemistry lab. I, I rely on instruments that if I want to have a level of a certain hormone or a peptide in the blood, that instrument is validated to give me a level of that compound. And it's also reliable. If I give it the same blood sample today, tomorrow, a week, a month, I'm going to get a reproducible value for that peptide. I've, I've explored some of the uh, um, different instruments that are out there to measure biofields. I haven't come across anything yet personally. It might be there, but I, I just haven't seen it. And um, I'll cite later, this I think is a limitation of why research in this area has been so limited. Science demands measurement, accuracy, and reproducibility, and I just haven't seen it yet. So that's biofields. What about biofield therapies? Well, simply enough, these are therapies devoted uh, to treating the human biofield. Earlier in some of the lectures, there were queries about how many individuals in the audience uh, have learned and treat patients with healing touch. So many of you are familiar with this um, uh, as a therapy. Now, even though there aren't scientific instruments to measure the human biofield, it turns out that human beings are actually quite good at it being sensitive to biofields and able to work with them in the context of physical health. So th these therapies simply seek to work with the human body's vital energy fields, such as changes in the field interact with and lead to changes in physiology. Uh, these various modalities, these, these are all already actually listed this morning, and some of you are familiar with them, I think. Uh, there's healing touch. I wanted to note healing touch because that's really one of the first ones I became aware of a couple of decades ago when San Diego Hospice here in town began to uh, teach it to the staff and also offer it to the patients. It's, it's easily the most widespread healing modality in uh, medical, medical settings. Another point I want to make about biofield therapy. So this slide, if you can't read it, it's 100% um, natural remedies. This says pure snake oil. <laughs> Biofield therapies are easily, easily the most controversial. Um, 
modalities, of all the CAM modalities. And the reason for this is several. I have a couple listed here I came up with. Well, they don't fit with broader Western context of science and reproducibility and measurement. And they certainly haven't fit traditionally in the allopathic medical model. And a lot of this, again, I think is because we just haven't been able to measure these things reliably. Despite the controversies, the uh, biofield therapies are, are the most utilized. Uh, biofield therapies are utilized in medical settings and are one of the most utilized CAM modality among cancer patients. Uh, for many years, I was on the symptom control group here at Morris Cancer Center and began to become aware of how widely used these healing touch and therapeutic touch and Reiki modalities are among patients. Patients are seeking them for healing, well-being. And as we looked into these, we realized there really aren't many research studies on them. And we thought it's, at one hand, an opportunity to conduct research, but it's also, also as, as clinical researchers, we felt it was incumbent upon us to actually start exploring them. Do they work? Do they not work? If they do work, how are they helping patients? And try to disseminate that information. So with that in mind, I, uh, most of my talk is, is actually data-driven. We've, we've done a study here at UCSD on biofields I'm going to tell you about. And I'm also going to share with you some findings from some colleagues at another institution. So this is a study that was just published actually last week in the journal Cancer, and it's the, which is the official journal of the American Cancer Society. And uh, it's a project we did here looking at uh, biofield therapies for fatigue and cortisol variability in breast cancer survivors. Before I tell you much about the study, I want to acknowledge uh, Shamani Jan. This project was really a, a brainchild of Shamani's, and she was a few years ago a graduate student of mine and had an interest in biofield therapies and wanted to do a dissertation on, this, on the topic. Uh, she left UCSD, took a postdoc at UCLA Cancer Center there, and now she's working full time with the Samueli Institute. It's a nonprofit foundation interested in human healing. And I'm also just acknowledging here the different entities that helped provide some funding for this particular study. <clears throat> so the title of the study you saw, we were interested in cancer-related fatigue. What is cancer-related fatigue and, and why study it? I think a really simple definition of cancer-related fatigue is a persistent sense of exhaustion beyond normal tiredness and that certainly interferes with daily life. Any of you who have gone through chemotherapy of any sort, you probably know what I'm talking about. This is a tiredness. It's kind of a bone tiredness, and it's beyond any relief you might get if you haven't slept adequately and you get you know, a good night's sleep. This, this sort of tiredness remains. And for many patients, uh, it, it, it's, it's persistent complaint. In fact, it's the single most complaint among cancer patients and survivors. Over a third uh, experience cancer-related fatigue, and it can last for 5, 10, many, many years after therapy has ended. And even after they're considered a survivor, they're cancer-free, they've gone through all the therapy, and they've never recovered from the fatigue. And it really adversely affects their quality of life. There had been some antidotal studies that biofield therapies were helpful for patients with fatigue. And that's what helped us, as we were interested in doing this research, to guide us to choose this as a topic, as an endpoint to study. Let me tell you about the, the trial we conducted. This was a blinded, randomized, controlled trial, and we examined four weeks of several therapies, one, a biofield therapy. And many of our patients were recruited right here from the Morris Cancer Center. The biofield therapy was a traditional hands-on energy. We hired uh, four individuals who had lo lots of training in a specific type of biofield therapy who had worked with cancer patients. We brought them into the study, and um, each patient enrolled in the project got one one-hour, no, two one-hour therapies a week for four weeks. Now, any of you know about various aspects of research, this concept of placebo, which an expectation affects. So a little humor here. Here's, these says greeting cards, and these are the get well cards, and these are the <laughs> the placebo cards. <laughs> so pl placebo and expectation is really a very important consideration in all research, whether we're given patients pills and we have to find a, an active pill that looks the same and smells the same. So we wanted to come up with a, 
a placebo therapy for the biofield energy because if you want to work in this area, particularly in CAM, and you want to get accepted and you want to do a good rigorous study, you've got to match it somehow. So we came up with what we called simply our mock therapy or our touch alone therapy. And we hired some uh, graduate students who had no experience whatsoever with biofield therapies. In fact, uh, we asked to get people who actually had skepticism about it. And then the real healers that we hired for the study trained these mock healers to pretend and to do everything that the mock healer, that the real healers would do. So they were taught where to put their hands on the patient's body during the course of the one hour therapy, how to behave, how to, how to act like a healer essentially. And I'll show you some data in a little bit that we were very successful because the patients were not able to distinguish between the mock and the biofield healers, which really helped our study design. Um, as part of their training, here's just a couple of added bits of data. So they were, the mock healers were trained to mimic the hand placements of the real healers. They were told to disengage, so not really intend to have any kind of healing or empathy with the patient, just go into what we called planning mind. Start thinking about your, you know, your day timer, what you need to do tomorrow. Do some mental arithmetic, whatever it takes. But just stay disengaged. But, but inwardly you're disengaged, but outwardly you look as if you're part of the study. And in addition to these two active therapy arms, we had very standard, traditional, uh, what's called a weightless control. So we also recruited women in the study who really didn't get anything. They just continued their normal life for the one month period and then we reevaluated them. We enrolled 76 fatigued uh, women breast cancer survivors. Uh, fatigue, the screening was, we utilized a, a very standardized and reliable questionnaire to assess fatigue. It's used in cancer all the time, and then we had a set point score. Any woman above this score was considered to have moderate to severe fatigue. They were enrolled in the study. And the study, uh, I said we recruited patients from here at Moores, but the study itself took place at the um, UCSD Medical Center in Hillcrest. There's a clinical research ward there, and all the patients were seen there, all their testing and the actual healing sessions. <clears throat> study aims, well, obviously one is uh, fatigue. We wanted to see if the biofield therapy would help fatigue. But we also were interested in depression, quality of life, and cortisol variability, which I'll, I'll just summarize that in a moment. Those were our primary aims. We also had a secondary aim. I mentioned a moment ago the importance of placebo in all kinds of research, and we particularly wanted to attend to it in this study. So what we did is, after each healing therapy, whether it was the real one or the mock, we gave the participants a short questionnaire, and we asked them, do you think you're in the real healing arm or do you think you're in the mock arm? Because remember, they were randomized blindly. They did not know what they were in. Half got the real McCoy and one got the fake, and the other half got the fake. So we, we tabulated that information and used it later uh, with some very interesting uh, effects. So why study cortisol variability? <clears throat> Those of you who know physiology, this slide shows a very typical circadian rhythm, circadian being 24-hour rhythm of cortisol in our blood. This is a very important hormone from the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal system, regulates broadly a, a, a host of important factors with energy metabolism and cognition, et cetera. Now there's a relatively non-invasive way to measure the amount of cortisol during the day of course, uh, and this is called the diurnal slope of cortisol, and you can see when we wake up in the morning, cortisol is very high. But during the course of the day, it naturally progresses and goes very low when we sleep. During the night, the levels go up. So if you want to measure cortisol variability, you've got to get samples during the day. And one way is, of course, to take a lot of blood samples, which isn't as convenient. But it turns out there's a lot of cortisol, free cortisol in saliva. And you can just take saliva samples from participants. They spit into a little tube and you freeze it. And then you measure the cortisol. And the amount of cortisol in saliva is highly, highly correlated with that in the blood. So it's a very nice non-invasive methodology. And in addition to the fatigue, we wanted to study cortisol as more of a hard biological endpoint. Fatigue is good. It's self-report. There's, there's error there, potentially. But something in the blood put it into a, you know, a, um, an instrument in the lab and you get 
reliable uh, data. So the reason we chose this with cancer-related fatigue is there's the literature out there showing that women who have cancer-related fatigue, the slope of the afternoon cortisol, which should be rather steep, is not so steep. That su suggesting there's, there's a dysregulation in the physiology of cortisol during the day and potentially at night. So for example, this is a study by Julie Bauer, uh, came out a few years ago, <coughs> fatigued breast cancer survivors, non-fatigued breast cancer survivors. And you can see that the slope is, is, is different between those who have no fatigue versus those who have a lot. Those who have a lot, the uh, cortisol was not going down to the low levels it should at night. <clears throat> and not only that, um, there are differences uh, for these same survivors in terms of how their cortisol responds to stress. Cortisol is a stress hormone, like the catecholamines and noradrenaline. When we're stressed, that system's supposed to respond and gear up our body. It doesn't, it doesn't quite, uh, in survivors, in response to stress, the cortisol isn't able to really mount the kind of response that's needed. So you can see together, there's, there's a bit of a dysregulation there. And, and one of the theories has to do with the inflammation. There's inflammation with cancer, some of the chemotherapies induce more inflammation, disrupt this system because the inflammation provides a, 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 a negative feedback on the, H, on the cortisol axis. And just to show you that this isn't only in breast cancer, but uh, other cancers too show this, this change in the slope. Um, and this is a slide from um, some patients with ovarian cancer. So cortisol is a fundamental axis that we chose to study in the, in the model of our biofield study. Okay, on to the findings. This is the most important part. Interesting, anyway. <laughs> I'll start with the fatigue findings. What did, we, what did we find out? So this slide, here are the color codes. The healing group is white, mock group, the, remember the fake healing, tan, control group. Now we were lucky. At the beginning, here are the fatigue ratings for all the participants who ended up in the different groups. And you can see they're pretty much identical, which is fortunate, you know, and you'd think in clinical studies when you use the randomization model that you're going to end up with groups where everyone's equal on whether it's age or, you know, height that you're randomizing on, but often it, it doesn't actually work that way. Sometimes we, we could have just as easily ended up with one of these groups with, with much higher or lower levels. But with that said, let's track the healing group. So here's the healing group. They had fatigue scores up around 30. Within one week, their scores had dropped to half, and then it continued to drop for the rest of the week's treatment, and at the end of the four weeks, they were down at this level. Now, interestingly, the mock group, they got fake healing, which was the intention. They also responded to the touch alone and had a reduction. It wasn't as much here as the active, but it was quite a drop. And then you can see those who are in the weightless control, no change, which is why you employ weightless control. You hope there's no change, there isn't always. Um, so that's the fatigue finding. So that was very promising, showing that the uh, biofield therapy did seem to, independently of expectation, actually induce some kind of change in the fatigue. What about the cortisol? This was our hard endpoint of a physiological mechanism. This slide shows the slope. This is, the again, from the afternoon, waking down to bedtime. We, we sampled cortisol at four points. Here are the color codings, and there weren't really any differences prior to the four weeks of treatment, which is what we'd hope. Well, what happened at the, as the result of the intervention? Well, it was very interesting. So the green line shows those who are actually in the healing group, and what happened is they had a significant change in the slope of their cortisol. Their, their cortisol started moving in the direction that you would want it to be in, in terms of demonstrating greater variability. Remember, typically the fatigue, they've lost their slope here, they've regained it. And this uh, was not seen so much in the other two groups. I want to speak a little bit about the uh, treatment guests. So I told you after each session, the participants guessed, am I in the mock healing or the real healing? When we tabulated that data, 75% of the women who got one of those treatment arms thought they were in the biofield healing. And this didn't differ whether they were actually in biofield or in the mock. 
So I think the actual number for the biofield was about 79%, and I think of the mock maybe it was 69 or something. So there was no real difference. So everyone, three quarters of the women thought they were actually getting biofield, although only half were, right? And uh, their guess was pretty consistent. So if I was a patient in the study, and my, after my first session I guessed, I'm in the biofield, the real one, I felt that way pretty much throughout the whole study. So we tabulated this information and used it in our analysis. And also another sign that the mock healers were really good and successful is that uh, they, there were no differences between ratings of the healer in terms of how friendly or how the participant in the study felt connected to them and sense of well-being. So it turned out to be a good control for the biofield. We didn't see an effective expectation on fatigue or the cortisol, but we did for the quality of life ratings. And I'll just share with you that data. So independent of expectation, this slide shows ratings of quality of life. And we used what's called the FACT-B questionnaire. It's a standardized instrument. And you can see uh, at intake, those who ended up in the healing group were here. Over the one month, they reported a significant increase in quality of life. Mock group had an increase too. There's an ongoing effect with the expectation there and the, presumably just the healing touch in the human encounter, which was discussed so much earlier. And the control group, no change. What about if we take this same data and now break it apart in terms of expectation? Oh, I got it. Sorry. Here's what we got. So again, let's imagine I'm in the healing group and I guess I'm in healing group. I, I by far and away express the highest increase in quality of life. But if I was in the healing group, but I actually thought I was in the mock group, my quality of life I reported not so, not so high. If I'm in the mock group and I guess healing, look, good effect. And finally, if I'm in the mock group, but I think, and I, and I am, and I think I'm in the mock group. <laughs> Again, not so good of an effect. So there was a clear interaction there between do I believe I'm getting an actual biofield healing or not in terms of how I felt broadly of quality of life. And uh, this is a figure from the journal article, as I said, we just published, that shows this more clearly. Actually, it doesn't show it very clearly. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why that is, but let me just tell you this, that this, these are the participants who were actually in the... Now, these are the participants who thought they were in healing. And they reported better quality of life. And these are the ones who thought they were in mock, keeping in mind that actually some were in the one they didn't think they were in. So there's a very interesting uh, interaction effect there. Interestingly, depressed mood, that was uh, one of our aims. And there was no difference over time. The depression ratings uh, did go down a bit for those in biofield healing. The mock group showed no change over time. But interestingly, the control group had some reductions over time in their self-reported depressed mood. So I want to just share with you the summary of uh, how we've interpreted these findings so far. So as far as fatigue, this first bullet, the effects of biofield healing on fatigue may be partially but not completely under explained by nonspecific effects. That is the touch, the rest, and interaction but not belief. So what do I mean by that? Well, you saw that those who were in the mock healing had a reduction in fatigue. So there's some kind of um, nonspecific effect of expectation, but the belief, post-treatment belief, did not affect fatigue. We found a, a significant effect of the biofield healing on the cortisol, restoring some of this rhythm that seemed to be lost as a result of potentially treatment or the cancer itself. And we didn't see any effect of that in the other groups. And then the last bit of data I showed you had to do with quality of life, okay? And there was uh, a, an effect there in terms of belief in treatment. If I believe I'm getting a treatment, I feel better, my broad sense of quality of life. Okay, I want to share with you uh, another study. This was done at the University of Iowa, and I wanted to show it to you for two reasons. One, this was a study done not on survivors, but on patients actively getting their chemotherapy. These were ovarian cancer, uh, patients, and while they were going through their six weeks of therapy, they were given healing touch 
throughout the study. So I'm also showing it to you because of a, uh, one of the data endpoints was, which was an immunological measure that's very relevant to cancer. So in this study, uh, again, healing touch, Comparing to healing touch, they had a relaxation therapy, not a, not a mock therapy. And this has been done a lot, the relaxation, than usual care. They studied natural killer cell cytotoxicity. These are white blood cells, one of the four primary lymphocytes. These cells go around and target uh, tumor cells and virally infected cells. So it's important that they're up to the challenge of uh, their typical functioning. And what we found, or what this author reported, is that those in the healing touch group during the chemotherapy six weeks, they managed to retain the amount of cytotoxicity during the whole therapy session that they had started with, whereas those in the other groups lost uh, significantly the amount of cytotoxicity. So here, maybe 35% of the cells were effectively targeting uh, the, the assay target cells, but in the other groups, it had dropped down quite a bit. Um, this study also examined depressed mood. And um, unlike our study, they did report uh, a decreased in depressed mood with the biofield therapy, healing touch, that they didn't see with the other groups. Um, I'm going to leave you with one final study. Some of you might be interested in learning more about biofield therapies and what kind of research is being done. Last year, Shamani and I, uh, we did a, a, a best evidence synthesis. We went out through all the medical literature found all the studies we could that people have done in biofield therapies. We reviewed them. We graded them in terms of quality. Was this a good study, a crappy study? Did they have controls? Everything. Did all the ratings and then came up with some uh, findings. So in total, in this study, uh, it was in the Behavioral Medicine Journal. We reported on 66 different biofield studies. Thank you. Uh, look, looking across effects on cancer, pain, dementia, uh, in inpatient distress, outpatient distress, among others. To, and briefly, uh, a best evidence synthesis simply means you go through all the studies you found and you, you score them according to four levels. Is there strong evidence of effect? Is there moderate evidence? Is there limited? Is there conflicting? What we found in this review are the following. We found actually strong evidence, the highest level of evidence you can find for biofield therapies reducing pain intensity in pain populations. We found a moderate evidence for reducing pain intensity in hospitalizing cancer patients. There's also mo moderate evidence that biofields are good for decreasing negative behavioral symptoms in dementia patients. And finally, moderate evidence for decreasing anxiety. So broadly, uh, uh, this was very supportive of uh, potentially applying biofuel therapies in different therapeutic and medical settings. And how might biofuel therapies work? Well, four possibilities. Uh, one, of course, that interests me the most is, well, a direct effect, that we manipulate the biofield of a human being in such a way that it directly has a positive effect on supporting the physiological functioning of the person. That would be the direct. Other, other opportunities here, a potentially expectation, which we did see some in our study, interaction of the patient practitioner, and then just context. Earlier in a, in a talk, the importance of just the healing environment was discussed. If I've had surgery and I'm looking at a beautiful window, I'm going to recover more than staring at a brick wall. Okay, that's it. Thank you.